This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, hey there, Hope 2021 is off to a good start for you. Good to have you with us. I am Ray. And I am Kenny. Bit of a change from the normal format. Instead of the latest news and feature stories, we're going to show you some of your favorite stories from 2020. We call it the best of YouTube. Straight ahead, born and raised in rural Georgia, they're reality TV's newest sensation, the Critter Fixers, and they're bringing awareness to a different side of Georgia agriculture. Also on the show, Kenny puts on his boots and cowboy hat and heads to the ranch. Okay, no hat and boots, but he did tour the LBJ Ranch in Texas, and evidently you guys enjoyed it as much as Kenny did. It was fun, that's for sure. And then later, when he's not tending to his cattle, chances are you'll find this Walton County farmer reaching new heights on both the national and international stage. He is a Georgia legend, and at 77 years old, he is still raising the bar for others to follow. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, sure, COVID-19 dominated the headlines in 2020, but the year also saw the burdens of two new reality TV stars who were based right here in Georgia. Terrence Ferguson and Bernard Hodges, AKA the Critter Fixers. Their show debuting in March, and I am happy to report that season two production is now complete and coming soon to your TV screen. After spending an entire day with them, they really are just two country boys from Georgia who grew up and fulfilled a lifelong dream of becoming veterinarians. Yes, if there's a critter that needs a fixin', doctors Bernard Hodges and Terrence Ferguson are on it. Doesn't matter if it's equine dentistry or conducting exams in front of students at Fort Valley State, their alma mater. These two have a passion for veterinary science. And that passion and enthusiasm, not to mention their entertainment value, is what caught the eye of producers at Nat Geo Wild. My two favorite class clowns. For sure. Here and, we are. And I say that with all affection. All affection. <laughs> Just looking at the promo, I mean, this looks like it's entertaining, it's yeah. educational, and you guys have a lot of fun. Tell us what we're going to see with this show. You're going to see a lot of fun. You're going to see almost like the Three Stooges. You know, you might be like, no, no, no. you be like, <laughs> now see, we, we just have a lot of fun. Um, yeah. You know, we don't take the profession lightly. Veterinary medicine has been good to both of us. Right. Um, but we also bring our twists. I mean, you know, it's, I guess what they say, about 1.7% of mm -hmm. practicing veterinarians are African American. We kind of bring bring our own twist to it. We we have fun too. We don't we don't take for granted the platform we have to kind of bring kids along and and so that they can see that they too can be veterinarians. You know, even me, I wasn't sure because I'd never seen a black veterinarian, and it wasn't until I was a junior in college that I saw my first black veterinarian, and it was at that time that I, I you know I was more assured like okay you can do this because he did this. And that's one of the platforms that this show provides for us is that you can see um, two minority, um, minority in two senses, minority in that we're African American, also minority in that we're males in the profession of veterinary medicine now so that you can visually see it and that means that you can achieve it because we have. So it provides a platform and we're real proud of that. Yeah, you know, and Bernard, we talked a little bit about it. The other thing I really like about this show, too, is, um, hey, Georgia, Georgia agriculture is going to get highlighted. Yeah, uh, for and, sure. and we're going to see a lot of it. I mean, tell, talk about the filming process, maybe something. That's the beautiful thing about this. I mean, we, we talk about Georgia. I mean, it's, you know, from our voices to the lay of the land to the drones, they, the, when they go over and they look at the crops. We go throughout Georgia, I got, you know, we went to go see a camel in Covington, Georgia. We went down to Montezuma to where the Mennonites are located. So we, you know, and did some sheep. So you got, you get a chance to see the row crops. You get a chance to see just how beautiful and how, you know, it's about success of the farm and how the, the farm to market. That's how, you know, it's very important. Cause I mean, a, a good food source and these kind of things are, are very important to the Georgia people and the Georgia farmers way of life. What was it like when Hollywood called you guys? Again, because you, you you say it all the time, we're just two good old Georgia boys sure. and things, but then Hollywood calls and were you uh, like, why me or why us? It was. Um, it was it was it was crazy, you know. And 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 we we now we go out and talk to kids all the time, and we can really say it, it doesn't matter if if you're good at what you do, they will find you. Here in Georgia, uh, large animal science, veterinary you know veterinary science here and. Uh, 
uh, it's so important. Are you trying to maybe push more students yeah. towards that? Because there is such a we need are, for large animal right. you know, vets we here actually, in, in the state. There's a need. We yeah. actually just did something for the GVMA. There's a Georgia Veterinary Medical Association. We talked about the need and, and how really it's about production. Actually, you know, if you can, if you can, you know, we're seeing so many farms go away. You know, the dairy farms aren't, you don't have as many. So it's about teaching husbandry and, and showing the farmer that, Look, we can work together, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we can make your farm more profitable. We can help produce more cows. We can help with the goat population. I mean, with this huge Hispanic population Georgia is starting to see, there's a need for more goats. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so it's just teaching the husbandry and showing those different things. And there is a huge need, especially in the rural areas like this, for people who do both. You know, people tend to only go do small animals, but you got to you got to do both. I mean, right. uh, uh, that both is needed. Are we going to lose you guys to Hollywood, though? Because we love having you here. You Never. Know, great Never. college here yeah. at Fort yeah. Valley yes. State. Yeah. We'll always You're be. You're going to stay true to your roots. Yeah, Student we'll, we'll be here in middle Georgia until, unless somebody runs us away from here. Exactly. You know, it's been, this area in Georgia has been so good to us. We've grown with the right. area, and the area has grown with us. We've seen um, babies grow up to go to college. Now they're married. You know, we've seen, you know, families um, that were not families at that time, now they're married, now they have kids. So this is our community. For sure. This is who we are. You know, when you think of Critter Fixer, you think of Middle Georgia. When you think of Middle Georgia, you think of Critter Fixer. Perfect. Because we just have that relationship. We're here that we owe so much to the community because they've given so much to us. And yeah. we'll be Georgia boys till, yeah. till the day we die. Especially after going to L.A. and going in the L.A. traffic. Yeah, we don't want any Two part of that. Two country boys walk around L.A. We yeah. walk around. Uh, I know people looking at us when we walk, <laughs> we walk around. Looking I around. thought we're rodeo drive. It's rodeo drive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what a, what a lasso. <laughs> like, I'm so hey, like, come on. Hey, we didn't know cowboys out yeah, here. Yeah, I'm like, is somebody going to come out here and lasso? Yeah. We walk around. Rodeo drive. I'm like, no. No, <laughs> so, oh, so we'll be right here. Yeah. They are fun, aren't they? After the break, the best of YouTube 2020 continues. We're going to take you on a Texas road trip to a cattle operation formerly owned by the 36th president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson. Whether or not it's permanent or just a temporary change in lifestyle, this much we know. Agriculture has a new look. Once busy highways in front of roadside markets, now visibly less congested. Human interaction and emotion, including those trademark smiles when greeting customers, now hidden behind masks. And as he walks his fields at Jaymore Farm in Alto, Drew Eccles can't help but wonder, what do I do next? This is definitely, this is different. Uh, you know, this is the first time something like this has happened. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 40 years old. I've seen freezes. I've seen freezes decimate this peach crop. I've seen uh, freezes punch me in the mouth in the strawberry business and too much rain and not enough rain. And, and I've heard my granddad and other farmers talk about, um, about things that, uh, you know, trials that they've been through over the years. This is the first time this has ever happened. That that's why that's why you hit the the, the uh, that's why you hit the panic button. It's this is just new. It's new to everybody, and uh, and I and I just hope and pray it's not the new norm. And rest assured, Drew isn't alone in his thinking. Whether it's a bigger operation like Jay Moore, or something as simple as a roadside produce stand, business owners like the larger supermarkets want to provide a service. But exceptions and sacrifices have to be made. Uh, what we've done uh, a few weeks ago, we actually shut down our pie kitchen, took all the tables and chairs out of that end of the store. Uh, so no pies, no ice cream, unfortunately. Um, then, you know, as, um, 
as this virus progressed and, and things started to worsen, you know, um, the employees are in gloves, the employees are in masks, uh, wiping down, just constant wiping down of door handles, of shopping carts, of those type things. Um, I, I want the public, I, I want them to feel safe at Jaymore right now, just like they do when there's no virus. So, um, I, you know, we're, we're trying, we're doing, we're doing the best we can, doing the best we know how to do. Our best of YouTube 2020 continues here on the monitor. Last year saw the ag industry take a significant hit from the pandemic. But despite the many challenges, farming operations continued to push on. One popular trout farm was no different. Bramlett Trout Farm worked day and night taking care of their stocked raceways, despite not even having a market for their fish. It was a story John Holcomb first brought to us back in May. Welcome to Bramlett Trout Farms, a, you guessed it, trout farm located in northeast Georgia in Fannin County. Terry and his wife Ruth have been running this farm for decades, and in those years have been building up a name for themselves and building up their clientele to mostly restaurants in the Atlanta area. We're a cold water hatchery and production facility. We raise rainbow trout, the Kamloops strain. Uh, we market about 90% of our fish to restaurants in the Atlanta area. We do do some live hauling. We hatch uh, approximately 60,000 eggs every two months. Uh, so we have various stages of growth to fit those different size requirements. Normally, they're a lot busier, but like most things these days due to COVID-19, things have slowed down a bit. In the past seven weeks, business has practically halted for the Bramlets due to restaurants closing. Typically, um, we put around a thousand pounds uh, of live fish, live weight fish, into the Atlanta restaurants each week. Uh, we go through a grading process where they're sized, uh, they go into an ice water slurry and that's where they expire. They're packed in ice and delivered directly to the restaurants, usually within three to four hours uh, of exiting the water. Again, ranging from 800 to 1200 pounds per week, uh, depending on, on the restaurant orders. Of course, when the restaurant shut down because of the pandemic, uh, that went to zero. So we went seven weeks without any uh, deliveries to those restaurants. However, just because business slows down doesn't mean that the work does. They grow the trout from eggs to full size at their farm, which takes at least a year, which means there's a lot of money involved and means they have to work hard to make sure even more money isn't lost. We have significant fixed costs. Um, we have a single pump up there that's pulling about $800 to $1,000 worth of power each month. Feed is extremely expensive. Um, eggs are also very expensive. We buy the best eggs that are available anywhere in the world. And uh, those costs remain. Uh, so when you cut off the income stream, then those, uh, those fixed costs certainly become pronounced. And uh, we've cut back in a number of areas. Uh, we've slowed the growth down on our fish some purposely. Uh, so that we do not exceed those weight ranges that we need for our restaurant trade and also it allowed us some savings on feed. However, there is a light at the end of the very long tunnel. In the last couple of weeks, Governor Kemp has started to reopen the state, including restaurants, and the Bramlets are beyond ready to get back to normal. We're very anxious to get back to the normalcy. Many of our restaurant customers um, had placed standing orders. We didn't even have to you know, seek, seek an order for each week. We knew what they were going to take week in, week out based on their demand. Uh, and we're very anxious to get back to that. We did have two restaurants come back online this week in a limited capacity. They're spacing their tables so that they meet the, uh, the governor's guidelines. Reporting in Fannin County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Well, before COVID-19 ruined 2020, there was the annual AFBF convention in Austin, Texas. A great time especially when Kenny and I ventured outside the city limits and visited the LBJ Ranch. Bucky Burgamy here was given special access to it all. Talk to me about what the history of this location is, what people that have never been to the LBJ Ranch Give, sure. give us a quick overview of the history. So we're settled in uh, Texas Hill Country, which is um, 
really a German part of Texas. Uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans moved here, and uh, President Johnson was born here on the property we're standing on. Uh, about a mile from here is his birthplace. And uh, 1951, he moved back here as an adult and uh, traded a house with his aunt, Frank, to um, start his, what we now know as the LBJ Ranch. So he reacquired his parents' property, his grandparents' property, and then kept expanding it. But this is where President Johnson lived and, and raised his, his Herefords. That was all over TV in the 1960s. So. There was a purpose that he specifically wanted to start the, the herd. Why? Right. Uh, he was a master politician, so uh, I think in 1957 he bought his first registered Herefords, and I, I really believe that was to improve that political image, make him the gentleman rancher, the businessman, and get away from that image of being a small town, maybe a southern politician. When you consider the politics of the 1950s and 60s, he's, he's really cultivating this image to his benefit. A lot of people may not realize how he financed this. It was actually Lady Bird that played a big role in that. It was. She was quite the entrepreneur. Uh, in the early 1940s, she, she took some inheritance money from her, from, uh, her father and bought a radio station here in Austin and was able to turn that around and, and buy more radio stations and eventually would make a multi-million dollar communications business and that really helped fund this ranch initially. So. Give us the experience of how the Johnsons turned this over to the National Park Service. Why and when did that happen? Right, uh, so this national park is the most complete presidential site we have in our nation. Uh, we have where a president's born, where he lived while in office, and then where he uh, retired to out of office, and also where he's buried. So in 1969, he moved back to the ranch, moves home, and uh, they start working on plans for this to become a national park. 1972, it becomes a national park. And uh, he donated about 680 acres of his 4,000 acre ranch. And he also donated a portion of his herd. He wanted it to remain a working ranch. Uh, without the cattle, we have a beautiful park. With the cattle, we have the ranch setting. So. The operational portion of the working cattle, who does that now? How does that happen? So the National Park Service actually runs the cattle operation. We own the cattle themselves. Um, LBJ's ranch foreman, who had been here since 1961, when it became a national park, he basically became a park ranger and kept on with his job, but he's the initial ranch manager. Uh, and like I say, today I work for the National Park Service. LBJ had a really unique way of branding his cows. Talk to us about that, why he did it. So President Johnson chose to brand on the horns instead of the hide, and uh, mainly because he was raising show cattle, he wanted to be known for his herd bulls, and he, they really felt that that horn branding kept a clean look on their body. It, uh, it's obviously painless for the cattle, but it really stands out. It gets your attention right away. And if you know anything about President Johnson, uh, he was a showman. He wanted to give people a good show, and that, that horn branding really stands out and gets, gets attention. Clint, thanks so much for having us Absolutely. out here. We appreciate it. Tell, now, for folks that want to find out more, if they want to know more about the ranch, what do they need to do? Sure, we've got a website for the National Park Service. If they go to nps.gov and then uh, they can look for Lennon B. Johnson National Historical Park. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Come back see us. Well, we have saved the best for last. After the break, we're taking this show to new heights with the most viewed farm monitor YouTube story of 2020. Finally this week, given the fact our next story has been viewed over 6,000 times on YouTube, it's safe to say that people are really fascinated by Cook Holiday. Yeah, what Kenny's referring to is the story I did back in January on then 77-year-old Cook Holiday of Walton County. Now at 78 years old, he farms every day. No big deal, right? Well, you see, Cook is also a legendary pole vaulter and still competing at the national level. Each morning, Cook Holiday makes the short walk from his house in Walton County to this, by definition, a pole barn. But it's not just a pole barn in the traditional sense. You see, at the tender young age of 77, Cook Holiday is an accomplished pole vaulter. And this, well, this is where he keeps his poles and the occasional piece of farm equipment. But to understand Cook Holiday and his love for pole vaulting, you must first take a trip back in time, 70 years to be exact, 
That day in Rochelle, Georgia, when a seven-year-old farm kid was riding the bus home from school and something caught his eye. I took a seat next to the window and I looked out and I saw somebody pole vaulting. I didn't even know what you, I didn't even know the word pole vault in the first grade. So I said, my goodness, I think that I could do that. So I go in and I throw my books down and my mom says, Cook, where are you going? And I said, to the wood pile and get me an ax, I'm gonna jump. And she says, what are you talking about? I got the ax, went to the woods and I cut down, well, I had to have two standards and I picked me a bamboo pole out and I got the hole diggers and I just started jumping from memory how he was doing. I knew nothing about it. I didn't even know it was pole vault. And from that day forward, Cook was hooked. In the years that followed, he set numerous records in both high school and college where he attended ABEC as well as the University of Wyoming on athletic scholarships. In his adult years, Cook was a teacher and successful track coach, winning six state titles before eventually being inducted into the Georgia Athletic Coaches Hall of Fame in 2009. Even now, at 77 years old, Cook is still competing, including this proud moment when he took home the gold for seniors at the World Championships in Toronto. And as I walked through his basement, snapping picture after picture, I couldn't help but think, all these awards and honors started with this simple routine ride on a school bus. But according to Cook, it started long before that. The way he explains it, it all began as soon as he could walk. I don't think I would be where I am today had it not been from growing up on a farm and my dad giving me the work ethics that I had. And as I've told people before, I didn't even have a, a wrist watch. You know, we worked from sunup to sundown in the summertime, of course, not during school. but. It, it's a parallel there that keeps me going because I learned to work. And if you're gonna be successful in anything that you do, where it's farming or whatever, you, you better be hungry and want to do it. And if you're not hungry for agriculture or uh, pole vaulting or throwing the discus or triple jumping, you, you're just gonna get beat, you know? That's, that's it, so I, it's definitely a parallel. One of the outstanding community honors he received is that the city named the sidewalk surrounding Winder Barra High School the Holiday Walk. And a bust of Coach Holiday is in place at the W. Claire Harris Stadium in Winder to honor Coach Holiday for his coaching accomplishments. Somebody came up to you and said, you have a choice to make, pole vaulting or farming? <laughs> <laughs> What's your choice? Photo finish for first. <laughs> Does that tell you? <laughs> I love it. And, and of course, if you don't, you eliminate yourself, you know. And I've always taught my kids, worse than a quitter is a man who's afraid to start. And the thing about it is, if you're thinking about getting in farming, you, I think you need to stick with it, you know. Because it is tough, I can say that. But health-wise, to grow up on a farm, you know, I, I just, you know, I just look forward to that sun coming up. And I look forward to it going down sometimes because I'm tired too. <laughs>